every year at the first night of Rosh Hashanah, it's the one time of year that I count how many years I've had the privilege to be the rabbi of CBI. Tonight is my 31st High Holidays with the congregation, which is hard to conceptualize. The passing of time has a element of mystery about it. It's mysterious in that when we look forward, it seems like it's going to go slowly, but when we look back, it goes very quickly. And in fact, at this phase of life, at the age of 64, I'm aware that it's a conveyor belt of time and that it just keeps moving. As I look around, it's so gratifying, particularly because it's the beginning of a new year. There is a sense of fresh eyes, of looking around and seeing faces that I've shared my life with, your lives with, through these years. My very first bat mitzvah was Stephanie Sklar. Lance Stern wasn't that far after, which is to say that some of my bar bat mitzvahs are now in their 40s, and it's all, um, or close to it. And so that quality of time, that time keeps moving, is an awareness that every year is a gift. And as we sit here together this year, I am aware looking around the room that for some it's been a year with health challenges. And that kind of year is a difficult year. A year that at times was touched by pain and the slowness that comes with dealing with uncertainty. And so it is our tradition as we begin a new year to pray for each other that it should be looking forward a year of renewed health. That's always number one. We say, you know, there's this Hasidic expression that it should be a good and a sweet year. And that's a later addition to the Shana Tova greetings. Sweet was added because on Rosh Hashanah, we're called to review our past year and to learn from it. And often, our most influential teacher has been the difficulties that were unanticipated. So as we look back, sometimes it was those physical challenges that were our teachers. And again, we look forward hoping that we won't have to learn from pain. And so that's where the expression developed looking forward, that may it be a good and a sweet year, that you shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to learn from um, the challenges that are also part of life. In fact, a congregant came to see me a couple years ago, and I begin to tell this because what I'll talk about tonight is my sabbatical. Um, a little bit about what I feel I gained drew from this year of travel. But the prompt to travel was due in part to a congregant who I was very fond of, who had retired about a year before and had developed a chronic illness six months into retirement. And he came feeling depressed. And he said to me, I was healthy, I was healthy, I was healthy, and then I wasn't. And it was a reminder that there are no guarantees and that we have our health while we do. I will add, he, I've seen him since, he's much better, which is also to add that there is always hope as we look forward with health. I went to see somebody. You know, I read, grew up reading these stories of the rabbi who comes high holidays, they can't find him. I identify part with that story. Everyone wants to get started, they can't find the rabbi. And they can't find the rabbi because he's out helping an old widow get wood for her fire. 
And I was always so touched by those stories that I have this custom of traveling, which in this case was on Friday with my shofar, to visit some congregants who have been struggling with the illness. And one who's just been uh, re-diagnosed, she'll find out this week if it's uh, a cancer or not, has literally been for 15 years struggling and not. And always one step ahead, or I should say, one step guided by the latest advice. So now she's doing infusion therapy rather than chemotherapy, which allows her to have a life. So I pause, knowing the service is almost over. <laughs> and you've come a long way, so I have a little more canvas of time. Pause to say that health is not to be taken for granted, that our lives are here only as a visit. And as that man came and said to me, I was healthy, I was healthy, and then I wasn't. As I looked forward to sabbatical, Linda and I said, you know, we're both healthy now, but there are no guarantees. Now is the chance to do the kind of travel that we might not be able to do in five years, let alone in 10 years. And it was her guidance to say, what interests us are cultures of the world. And that's the reason we should probably focus on places like Asia, where we to parts we haven't been, and later as it unfolded to Africa. Because for me, there's nothing more remarkable than people, and how we who share in common our physicality, who share in common the same challenges of health, yet put together how we define meaning, how we create community, how we celebrate life often in different ways. And so we had the privilege because of you, and I want to pause to thank you, the congregation of B'nai Israel, in my 30th year to have the year to explore the world. To be a rabbi is to be immersed in community. And it is deeply gratifying. And to do it well means to identify, to feel people's pain, and therefore to be fatigued at times. And a sabbatical that is my fourth is what has allowed me to stay on as the rabbi throughout these years. With the opportunity to step away catch my breath, and come back. So we had a canvas of time, a canvas of time that was 38 weeks. 38 seems significant in that the Israelites travel for 38 years from Mount Sinai to reach the Promised Land. So 38 had some significance. It wasn't all travel. Ten of the 38 weeks were spent in Israel. That was travel too. But Israel, for me, for most of us, Israel feels like going home, deeply for me. And so when I am in Israel, I'm blessed to have much family and friends. It does feel like I am learning about Israel but mostly I am enjoying my life that I'm sharing in Israel. It was one of my goals to be in Israel for the 70th birthday. And on Yom Kippur break, I will talk about Israel in greater depth and talk about the growing divide between American Jews and Israeli Jews and talk about it in a way that I wouldn't do as a sermon, which, mean the, which means that I will be political. I will not be political in any of my sermons, but I will in a conversation. And so Yom Kippur break, I will share both some of the political observations of life in Israel and those tensions with America. So the canvas. 
10 weeks in Israel, three visits back to America for different reasons, which was about six weeks, which left about 22 um, weeks to be on the road. When Linda and I got married, we went and did a Meyer Briggs exam. We didn't do it, we were already married, we didn't do it to decide to get married. I was working in a hospital as a chaplain that summer. I was still in rabbinical school, and they gave us all Meyer Briggs exams, these personality assessments. So I brought one to Linda to fill out as well, and brought it back to my boss at the hospital. And he looked at the results and he said, it's remarkable how similar you are, but I'd never want to travel with you. I said, why? We love to travel. He said, I can see. He said, you're remarkably similar, and the most extreme quality about the two of you is spontaneity. You're off the chart. You'd probably go to Africa on a week's notice. I said, we did go to Africa for our honeymoon on five days' notice. <laughs> and so what we brought in terms of a similarity of attitude is this willingness to be present in a moment and be spontaneous and to do so driven by an intense kind of curiosity. I'm privileged to have my daughter Anna home tonight from New York. All three of our California children now live in New York. <laughs> life, in, <laughs> life in America. Our children, when we've traveled with them, try to get us to sit on beaches. Um, and for them, we do. But by disposition, we're not wired that way. And I don't therefore know why you are. <laughs> but the children have educated us to enjoy relaxation. But by And so our curiosity and our spontaneity here, congregants who do international travel. We did a lot of our initial planning in Asia and allowed us to start traveling because I didn't um, do have the time before the holidays. So a little bit of an overview, but my goal in sharing about my trip is not to do um, Anthony Bourdain kind of travel stories. Rather, it's to model something for all of us. What I look to model in the next 10 minutes or 15, it's a short service, but I don't want to keep you. It's a long service for the next two days as well. What I want to model for you is the opportunity to pause tonight as well as tomorrow and the next day, to pause to reflect on your year. Every year is a journey a year in which, frankly, what is often most impactful was not anticipated sitting in synagogue a year before. Tonight is the opportunity to harvest, to begin to reflect on what you gained this last year and how that prepares you looking forward, looking forward. I have one teacher who's particularly wise, and I said to him, you know, what's your guidance on travel? And he said, my key guidance is to make your wife happy. He said, because this particular sabbatical will be your last, and it's the one that will prepare you for what will be afterwards, which will be more time with your wife. And oh, I, I heard her laugh. <laughs> she wasn't sitting here. I thought I was speaking with her not being in the room. <laughs> She's laughing apparently because she can judge for herself whether I met that test or not. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just to say it's a very high bar. <laughs> Mark Twain said, I should quote him to be exact, Mark Twain said, I have found that there ain't no sure way to find out whether you like people or hate them to, than to travel with them. 
I love you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, <laughs> and it was a good year. So, one thing I learned is that there's value in traveling sometimes as a group. We left last year in October with CBI and CSP, the Community Scholar Program, doing a trip to Israel together. We've done a trip to Israel together as a congregation before and hopefully will again in the future. What I was reminded in traveling with a group is that there are things you can do in a group you can't do alone because it takes sometimes money to bring in speakers that you would want to meet. In Israel, on that trip, we met people like Amos Oz, one of Israel's foremost writers, Edgar Carrot, Linda's favorite satirist. We were able to go into places like a refugee camp, a, a Palestinian refugee camp, Aida, located in Bethlehem with the New York Times writer for the Palestinians and get a sense of what a Palestinian refugee camp is like, which we would not have been able to do traveling alone. So although by disposition we are spontaneous, there was great value in particular in going to Israel. I've lived in Israel for five years, it, adding up all my time, and there was so much more to discover. I'll just say a word about Israel. Israel is a miracle. It is a miracle. It is a country that is surrounded by the, one of the toughest neighborhoods in the world, in which it's constantly having to deal with the fact that there are missiles falling, in which the young people, rather than planning to go to college, have to prepare to go to the army. A country that is claustrophobic because of enemies all around and on the other side. And do you know that Israel in the most recent UN survey was ranked the eighth, the eleventh happiest country in the world? Eleventh happiest, America was 15th or 18th, it had gone down. Eleventh because of a shared sense of place and purpose. I was there for the 70th anniversary of Israel. I first went with a cousin of mine to the, the Holocaust Memorial. It was, it was an event, I got tickets through a friend where who's who from the Israeli government presented. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke, the President of Israel spoke, Supreme Court was all present, it was a great privilege to be in that moment with the leadership of Israel. And I went with a cousin named Eli Spitz. He's named for the same ancestor that I'm named for. But when he, fi he, when he finished college, he went to the Weizmann Institute some 30, some 40 years ago and got a master's in computer science. Stayed on in Israel where he raised a family and became an active settler. And so when we went together to the Holocaust Memorial, he presented his Tudad Zuhut, his Israeli ID card. It said Eli Spitz. I presented my passport that said Eli Spitz. The guard looked at these two names, looked at the two of us, and said in Hebrew, how did this happen? <laughs> to which we replied, the same person. What was different about that Yom HaShoah and the six representatives of the six million, what was different for me is their video story. They all talked, they came from different parts of the world, some were men, some were women, each had a distinctive story. But what they all shared in common in the little video was that they had survived and had gone on to help build the Jewish country and in the video were surrounded by grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And that sense of the privilege 
of our extended family to live in Israel, to have dedicated their lives to building a Jewish country. To my regret, property in Israel has more than tripled in the last 15 years. My regret that I didn't buy 15 years ago. So that today, Tel Aviv is more expensive than New York. Housing is more expensive today in Tel Aviv than in New York City. I just saw that statistic last week. And that's because Israel has become an engine of talented and talented startups that are doing very well. You saw just, la just this last week, SodaStream, that was had its major factory around the Jericho area and had to move because of BDS, just sold to one of the major soda companies for several billion dollars. That was just last week. So Israel's economy, you just can't believe it. And I'll add one more, and here I am talking about Israel rather than the other six, 15 countries I went to. Israel has natural gas off of the Haifa area, and in the next three to five years will be one of the world's leading producers of natural gas in the world. They're currently building a pipe to Cyprus, and from Cyprus it will go to Europe. So that Israel's economy now will go that much higher. So that's Israel, and so much more to say about it, but it's not all easy. No place is easy up close, but Israel is even more uneasy up close. So some of the lessons of travel. I won't talk about all the countries, but I'll tell you what they were just to give you context. Nepal, parts of India we hadn't been to, Bhutan, a mountain kingdom in the Himalayas, uh, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, islands in the Indian Ocean, Muslim islands that are famous for their scuba diving, the Seychelles on the way to South Africa, um, islands off of the central coast of uh, Africa. South Africa was a brief visit to Zambia and then to Zimbabwe. Um, back to South Africa and then to Dubai. From Dubai to Spain. Back to America for the gala and other events. And then returning for me to Israel. Um, house sitting some fr a friend's apartment for a month and then reconnecting with Linda as we went to Denmark to meet our children so that Anna and John could join us in Israel and ending up in, in um, Italy and Morocco. The Morocco trip we did with an Israeli tour group it was 11 days immersed in Hebrew and Israeli culture. So the tail end. Israel's the front end. Morocco, the Israeli group, the tail end. One of the reasons we wanted to be with an Israeli group is we were fascinated wherever we traveled, whether South Africa to places like Uchhorn. Uchhorn, a remarkable place in South Africa. I bring to mind an Israeli group in Uchorn. Uchorn is one of those experiences of the imprints of Jews around the world. In before World War I, the big fashion statement were ostrich feathers. Lithuanian Jews who had gone to Uchorn were at the center of the ostrich feather business in the world. It was like gold mining, but better. They weren't as heavy. And they would ship them all over the world. And there are still Jews in Uchhorn, but it's really in the middle of nowhere to speak of. 
And there we are in Uchorn, and there's not just one tour bus of Israelis, there's two tour buses. And they got it wired. So where we have to sit outside in the sun to eat lunch with our tour guide, the Israeli tour groups, they go inside to eat. They have it wired. They're well taken care of. But what was distinctive about the Israeli tour groups is their age. The most common tour groups you now see in most places in the world are Chinese tour groups. China, money has begun to roll, and they have a real problem. The Chinese don't speak English. English is the language of the world. They therefore have to be in a tour group. They can't travel on their own by and large. Israelis, in contrast, choose to travel in tour groups because of their army experience or their cultural experience. It's a nation that's very familiar. And what's different is they travel in their 70s and 80s and even more. We saw them in the Maldives, a Muslim country. We saw them in the Seychelles. In Morocco, there are 50,000 Israeli tourists a year. When you go into the mountains, there's people always trying to sell something, and they'll say in Hebrew, The children have learned Hebrew in the mountains of Morocco, and they'll say, and we'll take shekels, because there aren't such many tour groups going to Morocco in terms of 50,000 a year from one country, from Israel. And so we chose to travel in Morocco for 11 days with a religious tour group, because that way it was going to be kosher and observe Shabbat. And they were very, as if it was the army, they were on time. Times to be a little complaining, our people. But by and large, the, mo the least spoiled people I've ever traveled with willing to walk and push themselves and stay up late to do it. And so to pull it together without a review of all these countries, to say as follows. Last Saturday night, I put together photos. It was my first photo slideshow in honor of Slichot about my travels. And as I gathered my photos, what I became aware of is my own delight in reviewing all the places Linda and I had been. But what I am also aware of is it wasn't always that easy. It was fatiguing to be on the road in a different bed every two or three nights. Sometimes people trying to take advantage of you and sometimes succeeding. We both wound up in the ER for different things at one point or another which just goes with the, the demands of the road. And so the first thing I became aware of is that as gratifying as it is to look at when it's done, in the midst of doing it, in any one day, somebody's a little bit cranky, you're a little bit hassled, you're a little tired. It doesn't move smoothly. It's effort to travel. And I'm reminded that one day, as I look back at my life, or for all of us, as we just look back over this last year, we should be able to call up those moments that make us smile, and yet know that the same moments that made us smile were often embedded in challenge. Or as I told my children when they were small, good things come wrapped in hassle. For indeed, that's the case. And so the first thing I learned in completing my trip is that whatever I'm doing, whatever any of us are doing, we have to keep in mind that the time is finite because that trip, sabbatical, it's over. And one day, I'll say the same thing about my life. The time that we have is finite. And day in and day out, no matter how well off we are, there is hassle. And yet, 
we are to savor and enjoy precisely because it's precious. It is finite and therefore precious in the years that we have. The thing I learned is that among the things that were most memorable and gratifying are the things that took the most effort and were a little scary. So hiking as we did for only five days, at only five days now, in the Himalayas meant day one, 3,300 steps, and not knowing how we would adjust to the altitude, getting closer to the Himalayas. Or my paragliding for the first time, which means flying off a mountain with a guy in my back, was exhilarating. Or scuba diving for the first time. I had never scuba dived, nor had Linda, and we were in the Maldives, among the most beautiful coral reefs in the world. It was a bit like a bicycle with trainer wheels and that we had our own scuba diver with us, just for the two of us, teaching us how to breathe and then how to go underwater. And ultimately, I'd be going underwater um, 40 feet, 45 feet. And you look up, and there is just water. And more, the fish are swimming all around you, and you're like part of a new world, for me a new world, of being with the fish, of looking down at the corals, these beautiful purple and blue corals as they open up and swallow fish. There's a world of surprise and beauty that took literally my breath away, but I had an oxygen mask. But that too is not something that w w came without trepidation, which is also to remind myself that in looking forward, the things that are often the most rewarding and memorable take careful planning, careful consideration of the risks, but are a product of stretching ourselves. The more we stretch, the more we grow the more we're surprised. Last, I want to just say what a beautiful world we have. A beautiful world and a world that in many ways is challenged. To be able to see those Himalayas and to walk in the mountains is to feel the privilege of a world in which there are mountains 30,000 feet tall, the ceiling of the earth, but those mountains used to be white all year round. In November, they were patchy. The world's climate is changing. In South Africa, Linda and I were so grateful to be there because there was so much beauty, but such a water shortage. And it's not, it is in part because of a lack of planning in places like Cape Town, but it's more than that there is drought throughout Africa, and there's a huge displacement that's going on in the world today. And so I was reminded of the gift we all have of a beautiful world that is in many ways endangered, in ways that are hard to fathom, but clearly changing, and is our responsibility to help preserve. So those are three takeaways that life is precious and that we are to look back and understand that life always has some hassle. But that's part of life and it's to be savored and enjoyed while we can. That the world in which we live is a world of enormous beauty and it is our privilege to live in this world. A gift from God and that as we look forward in the year to come, that setting goals for ourselves that are a stretch, no matter our age, to find those things that allow us to feel more engaged with life is to feel the gift of life. May you each, tonight and tomorrow and the next day, take some time to reflect on this last year there is so, so, so much I would want to tell in terms of the amazing people we met and the
the memories that Linda and I were able to fashion together. It was a wonderful year. Ribbon Shalom, Master of the Universe, as we reflect on our years, may we each draw out goodness, and may what we draw